Welcome again, everyone, to another episode of the Philosophy of Art and Science. As always, if you support these videos, you can join the YouTube channel directly at even a dollar a month or head over to patreon.com slash aksum, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash a-k-s-u-m. Today we've got a, a, a deed, a proud son of Aksum, uh, Deacon Salomon Kebriye. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too, Brother Deacon. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you, long overdue. It's funny, we've been Facebook friends and other social media friends for a long time. And then later I found out uh, La Casa, it's a small world of uh, Ethiopian elites who left Ethiopia and then their yeah. children. And <laughs> we happen to be family friends too. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your, your, your grandfather and my father were very good friends. We're very, very good friends. That's right. And my mother would have been very young and you even way, way, way younger <laughs> when she yeah. left Ethiopia. Yeah. So th there was a, a reason for that intergenerational loss. And, and we'll talk about that too, because that's part of what, what sparked me wanting to have this conversation with you. I, I do want to, to talk about um, big figures, including the emperor Haile Selassie, your, your own father and, and you. But I do want to begin because one of my favorite things that you do are is something that's recommended by an entrepreneur that I follow a lot, Gary Vaynerchuk. And that is to write long form, you could call them essays or, or stories on Facebook and in other media like LinkedIn or wherever it may be. And some people, it's funny, they, they just use social media as a sort of release and they don't want to maybe do some critical thinking on there. But you take your time and you have these very well thought out long passages that I love reading. And I'm not someone who shares everything that everyone does, but almost everything you'd write, I just immediately share it, whether it's with the Ethiopians for constitutional monarchy that you and Ted La do, uh, Lich Ted La do a lot, or whether it's uh, the ones on your personal page. I just, I can't help. I, I feel compelled to hit that share button. So I'm curious just because there are other writers in the audience and aspiring writers and, and other creatives. If you could talk about what your, uh, maybe not a lot, but you know what your main kind of career is and then how you do writing on the side. Because as far as I know, you're not like a, a professional writer yet. No, 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 no I'm not. Um, professionally, I, I work in the legal field. I, 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 I've worked for many years in the legal departments of large financial institutions. Um, mm -hmm. And so there is writing involved, of course, but not this type of writing. Um, I, I've always been very obsessed with history, um, even as a little kid. Um, you know, I, I, I initially, when I first went to school, grade school in Ethiopia, I went to a school called the Good Shepherd School, which was a missionary run school out in Makanisa. Now it's part of the city of Addis Ababa completely, but back then it was considered a little bit out of town. And it was a school, a Protestant American missionary run private school. And uh, they did not have Amharic instruction for mm. the Ethiopian students. Um, they did not teach uh, Ethiopian history. Um, so it was uh, when the Americans were expelled from Ethiopia, um, I transferred over to the Sanford School, uh, which is an English run school. And they did have Amharic instruction and Ethiopian history. That's and that's my mother's school. Of, yes, yes. Um, it was a, you know, it's, it's, it still exists in Addis. It's, a, it's, it's a, one of the top um, schools in the country. Um, a, a funny side note yes. is that in 1994, I was born in 1990 in the U.S., and the first time I ever visited Ethiopia was in 94 after the Northridge earthquake, which was a huge earthquake in the Los Angeles area. Yeah. Yes. And my mother enrolled me at the Sanford School the Sanford in the School. early 90s for about two months while okay. I was there. And they were expecting to teach me Amharic, as you say, they instruct Amharic there. And she said, oh no, I need you to teach this American boy English because <laughs> I didn't speak English yet at that time because my household was actually an unofficial embassy of Ethiopia. <laughs> and so the first time I got curricular instruction in English was at the Sanford School in Addis Ababa. How oh, ironic is that? Um, that's <laughs> That's a funny, um, you know, the, the, it's a story for another day, but um, I can tell you that there was a, there was a little bit of a trauma transferring from an American missionary school mm -hmm. to a 
a, a British run school um, as far as my English. Um, really? It was, it was dramatic. Uh, there were so many differences that uh, the British just completely found outrageous. Uh, but that's a story for another day. Uh, full stop and <laughs> Z and lift and all that. Yes. Yeah, lorry instead of truck. But um, yeah, so, you know, when, when I arrived at the Sanford School, I had this distinct disadvantage, um, both in Amharic and in, um, in knowledge about my own country. Um, and, you know, the, they, they taught their own history as well, the British. So, you know, I knew, I, I, I learned about the, you know, the genealogy of the British kings, and I can recite it for you from Henry VII to the present queen. And I thought, you know, why can't I do that for my own country? Why don't I know that about Ethiopia? I mean, I knew about Imperai Selassie because of my family and, you know, their, 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 their involvement. Um, and I knew about Impermanelik, and I knew about, you know, marginally about Impresodito, but I didn't know much further back from that Emperor Teodros II. So I made it a point to sit down and, and read about, you know, the various Ethiopian monarchs and the history of the country and, you know, what happened and where it happened, etc. cetera. So, um, and I had a father who, uh, who was very, very into history as well. And he had a circle of friends. Uh, I was very lucky in, in, in the circle of friends he had, uh, people like Professor Asraf Ondeyes, uh, Professor Naviat Tafari, who were both medical doctors, but also very knowledgeable. Um, I, I, I don't know if I've ever met uh, an Ethiopian theologian that knew more than Professor uh, Neviat Tafari. Uh, wow. Professor Asrat knew, um, knew Ethiopian history in and out. And he, uh, his, his son and I have known each other since kindergarten, and he would take us on, on trips to Langano and so on. And, and nighttime reading was, you know, bedtime reading was a chapter from Henry Blank's uh, history of Theodorus II, uh, mm -hmm. but the Amharic translation. Uh, yeah. uh, Translated uh, by my grandfather. There you go. Nice yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, which is a fantastic book. I, I, I have both the English and the Amharic versions. Uh, the Amharic version is just great. It's just, um, it has that much more impact, I think, when you read it in, the, in the Amharic. Um, but that's, that's how I got into historic writing. Um, and as far as Facebook, um, I just noticed that there was a lot of, of, of history, quote unquote, uh, <laughs> that was appearing on Facebook that was wrong. And, you know, uh, some of it comes from just people not knowing because historic uh, education is very neglected in Ethiopia, has been uh, for many years. And uh, some of it is deliberate political distortion. And um, there was nobody that would set things right, or there was nobody that would, or people were scared to do it. Um, so I thought, you know, a good way of, you know, I, I would jump it off and say, well, that's not true. I see something and I say, that's not true. But then I realized that wasn't enough. People needed to know what the truth was. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, there was a need for a kind of uh, non-slanted, uh, non-slanted account of Ethiopian history. So I put it down on, on Facebook and I would write it. Um, uh, and I guess it is an outlet for me, just as a, it's a release for some people to go on Facebook and make a statement, you know, and, you know, get it out there. This is, I guess, my release um, to make sure people know that there is an account of history that isn't necessarily what people have been telling them, um, because everyone has uh, an agenda these days. Um, so I try to, I mean, it's very hard to not have a point of view. Uh, it's very hard to be neutral. Uh, in, in your own opinions will always come out in your, in your, in your writing. Um, but I try as much as possible to put the facts out uh, and, and then put my interpretation or my views in there somewhere, but uh, in a way that people feel free to disagree with me and say, well, you know, that's very interesting, but you know, your conclusion's not right or I don't agree with it. And so I like that. And uh, it's kind of gotten me a little bit of a following, which, you know, I, I, I like that people are interested. Uh, but I saw a need, and that's that's why I jumped in. I'm so glad you jumped in to fill that need and to, to fill that gap. And from my analysis of what you're saying, I, I think 
a lot of postmodernism is BS, but if I am being charitable to the movement, one of the the brilliant things that they did was illustrate this idea that it's almost impossible to be objective. I think, you know, they get into trouble when they want to say it is impossible, but it's almost impossible. And, you know, there's always lenses that you have to uncover. And sometimes the lens is so um, steeped within the bias of that century, as uh, C.S. Lewis would encourage people to read texts from different centuries in his introduction to On the Incarnation by Athanasius, which he wrote the introduction to the, the English translation. And, um, you know, what I appreciate and, and see in you is that your bias, if you are to have a bias, is that you are pro-Ethiopian and not in a narrow sense of like pro-Ethiopia from 91 to 2018 or pro-Ethiopia from 74 to 91, but pro-Ethiopia period, uh, across the more favorable period to you and in general in the present. And I think the biases certain people have is that they have much more limited and narrow scopes of which they are going to claim they're pro-Ethiopian if they are at all. And some of them, as you said, are deliberately people who want to Yugoslavize or Balkanize Ethiopia, chop her up into 30,000 pieces. And that that sort of blatant agenda doesn't make for anything approximating objective history <laughs> in history books, let, let alone on, on social media, where, the, like you said, this the lack of, of knowledge is is widespread. So I'm, I'm so glad you you begun this. And it's funny because sometimes, you know, you and I may know some things and I'm going to push you to explain them more because the audience may not. You glossed over this expulsion of the Americans when you're talking about how you switched from an American to British school. The reason behind it, I'll say in short, and I'd love to have you expand, is that the Soviet-backed communist military junta of Ethiopia took over in the middle of your education and, yes. and prompted that. Can, can you talk about that uh, and yeah. how that would be anti-American? Sure. Um, so uh, as some of your audience may know, um, Ethiopia you know, was a very strong, staunch US ally um, from the end of, well, from, from World War II uh, to the 70s. Um, the United States was very key in, in, in helping Emperor Haisalasi pry the fingers of British uh, administration off of Ethiopia after the liberation from fascist occupation. The British wanted to stay. They wanted to establish a protectorate over Ethiopia. They still had ideas of an African empire from, from Cairo to the Cape, and Ethiopia would fit in great because, you know, headwaters of the Nile and what have you. Um, but um, the, the U.S. was able to help the emperor pry the U.K.'s fingers off his government. Um, and as a result, there was a very long and very uh, close military and uh, economic uh, relationship between the U.S. and Ethiopia. In 1974, as you know, um, there were uh, massive uh, disturbances in Ethiopia, civil unrest, um, which led to a military coup. Um, it was a revolution in, in, in every sense of the word, uh, but the revolution which could have led to maybe reform was taken a completely different direction. Uh, lower ranking um, officers uh, from the military uh, took over um, and, and uh, launched a very, very bloody um, uh, campaign to remake Ethiopia into an Eastern Bloc Soviet style uh, republic. And um, in the midst of this, in the early stages actually, um, things started to get very difficult for them as various rebel groups um, popped up, um, EPRP, the EDU, the TPLF, various liberation fronts and, and, and uh, different uh, flavors of Marxist movements. Um, and at the same time, the Republic of Somalia invaded Eastern Ethiopia to uh, take part of Ethiopia, uh, known as the Ogaden, uh, which was populated by ethnic Somalis and wanted to incorporate it into a new greater Somalia. Um, the US uh, under President Jimmy Carter 
uh, decided that Ethiopia's human rights uh, record at the time was very poor. Um, the, the government at the time had executed a lot of people and was also killing uh, people extra judicially on the streets uh, that opposed it. So uh, President Carter decided that he would uh, not deliver on weapons that had been purchased by the Ethiopian government. And of course, Ethiopia was going to war with Somalia. Um, so what Ethiopia did was they embraced uh, the Soviet Union completely. And the Soviet Union and the US essentially switched allies in the Horn of Africa. The US went to Somalia, Soviet Union came to Ethiopia. Um, and as a result, uh, there was a, you know, a fairly large American community in Ethiopia. Um, there was a military assistant group or MAG as it was known. Um, there were US Marines, there were, uh, that you know were at the embassy and there were various military advisors uh, at various levels in the Ethiopian military. There were also lots of missionaries and other people that, that had come to Ethiopia from the US. They were all given about, I, I believe it was 48 hours or it may have been a little more than that oh. to pack up and leave. And so the Good Shepherd School closed and uh, the, you know, uh, those of us who were there went to various other schools. Some people went to the, the, what had been the American Community School, became the International Community School. Others went to Sanford. Um, but across the board, Americans, a lot of American uh, military and non-military staff had to leave Ethiopia in a very, in very short order. Um, and it was, uh, it was, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's strange to talk about it now um, as it's almost like a story. Uh, but when you're living it, it was it was a very, very traumatic and scary time. Um, and as a small boy at the time, mm -hmm. it was uh, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. Everything that was happening around us was terrifying. Um, and th that's another reason why history is so important, that people tell their experiences and write down their experiences because they will be lost. There are people who alive today who um, don't know that a lot of the things that happened in Ethiopia were happening um, because people just don't write them down or they they feel that some things are better forgotten, um, but they shouldn't be forgotten because we can only learn lessons from our history when we know what that history is. That's absolutely right. Professor Haile Gerima was working on his World War II from the Ethiopian perspective. You know, some people don't include that part in the beginnings of it, but you know, the Italian, the second Italian invasion, the fascist invasion of Ethiopia, he was showing the raw cut of the footage in LA and he was uh, dropping some work, some admonition <laughs> to the Ethiopian community in Los Angeles, telling us we need to do more to record stuff like that. And that was a number of years ago. And I don't know if that movie is out yet. I haven't seen it. I've only seen that raw cut and what I remember is uh, probably my podcasting that began in the pandemic about a year and a half ago or a year and a few months ago. One of the factors was this admonition from <laughs> Professor Haile <laughs> that was sitting in the back of my head. And um, I've, I've been going out of my way, especially to, to get the real elders as much as I can. Um, but it's... Uh, obviously easier to get younger folks, you know, you, <laughs> you could use your elder status on them. You can't use your junior status to compel the, the older people. Some, some of them, as you said, experience traumatic experiences that they do not want to speak about in public. And, you know, who am I to compel or even push and prod them? But I, I definitely leave this channel open to that. And if anyone is watching and, and knows an Ethiopian elders, this is absolutely the field of Ethiopian studies and the, all of Ethiopia could be said to benefit from this. My my grandfather in his memoir, um, in the beginning, he says, you know, it's not our culture to write about yourself. So you don't see a ton of autobiographies. But he's, he's like, I'm not egotistical. The reason I'm writing about myself is that future generations will be able to learn the general history of Ethiopia from my experience of it at a particular time and, and place. So... Uh, I'm I'm sad that you had, you experienced this trauma of the communist takeover of Ethiopia, which is uh, the greatest change 
uh, not great as a good thing, but great as the, the biggest, the biggest um, yeah. <laughs> change in, in Ethiopian history, I would, I would argue. I don't know if you'd, you'd say differently. And in fact, you had a, a post that you shared recently, which I think you originally wrote a few years ago. And it was about that date, um, Maskaram 2nd or September 12th, 1974 slash 1967, depending on its Western calendar or Giz calendar. And, um, you know, for me, one of the things I always mention to people is the sort of the immediate execution of, you know, 60 of the top brass elite, Masafent and, and Makwanent, the, the hereditary ruling class and the merit-based ruling class. And, you know, what does that do to a society? For I also mentioned the uh, the expulsion or, you know, threat of it that led to all but two ambassadors returning. I mean, in general, a brain drain and a brain elimination on on a scale uh, that's so grand, it's hard to fathom. I don't even know if everyone has all the statistics of it yet, and I think it's still having ramifications for the ongoing civil war that we have right now in in Ethiopia, because the ruling regime, which was relegated to a region, began itself as a Marxist-Leninist movement, which is uh, a part of that. It, could you talk about that that post? you recently made that I think expresses really well the the gravity of, of change that occurred in Ethiopia. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I wrote it a couple of years ago um, to mark uh, the anniversary of the uh, deposing of Emperor Ayn Selassie. Um, the movement had, had gained wheels in the months before that. Uh, Western writers often called it the creeping coup because it just seemed to be happening in stages. Um, members of his court were being arrested. Members, you know, high-ranking um, military officers were being arrested. Uh, and then the emperor was one of the last to be picked up and, and, and uh, detained. Um, but it, it, did, it, it, it did mark a fundamental shift in Ethiopian society. Um, we had gone uh, for 3,000 years as a monarchy. Um, most of that time uh, ruled by the same single dynasty, the Solomonic dynasty. We had a, a couple of people who were questionable as to whether we're Solomonic, and we had the Zagwe dynasty. But other than that, we had <laughs> the Solomonic dynasty. And now we had a group of, of, of very junior military officers um, that had come in and very brutally uh, tried to change Ethiopian society. And, and what they did was they struck at the very root of what it was to be Ethiopian, um, which has really um, had, we're, we're still uh, experiencing the consequences of that. Um, abolished the monarchy was one. Uh, just a couple of years later, um, they arrested the patriarch of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, Abba the Theophilus of Blessed Memory, um, he was imprisoned and he was eventually very brutally uh, murdered. Um, the, the, the massacre of the 60s, which you mentioned, um, the 60 highest, well, it was actually more than 60, um, but the highest officials of Imperial Ethiopia, two prime ministers, the president of the Crown Council, um, many ministers, regional governors, um, generals, uh, very people who had worked hard uh, for Ethiopia, aristocrats, people that were humble born as well, merit-based and hereditary aristocracy, as you said, uh, people that were working for their country, people who had fought and, uh, against the fascists, um, country elders, are the elders of our community, um, were killed. And I have a very distinct memory of that day. Um, one of our um, extended family members was an ambassador outside of Ethiopia and had, as you, as you mentioned, uh, they had been recalled to the country. And he was one of the few that returned. Uh, he was elderly. Um, he didn't see himself being, you know, um, going into exile and living any kind of life. So you know, he was a former military officer. He came back to Ethiopia. Was that Ambassador Ahadu Sabre? 
No, it wasn't. Oh. Um, actually, General Wildhorn Shitka. Um, he was the ambassador to Yugoslavia at the time. Uh, previous to that, he had been military attaché in Rome. But he, he had come back, and there was a lunch um, that was given in honor of his return. And uh, our home, our family home, was in the old airport area near Abba Dina Police Academy, not far. Back then, it was very bucolic woods and everything. Now it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's the it, Beverly Hills. Yeah. It's, it's basically New York now. <laughs> but um, back then, it was very quiet. And we were not far from the Princess High Hospital at the time. Now it's the Torhai or the uh, Armed Forces Hospital. But um, the, just the night before this lunch, um, there was a, a horrendous shootout, the first that I can ever remember. Uh, horrendous shootout, electricity went out, et cetera. Because not far from our house, right next, well, actually within the, the, the environs of the Princess High Hospital was the home of General Aman Amdo, who was the temporary head of state uh, that they had put in place when the emperor was overthrown. And the Dirk had come to arrest him and had ended up in a huge shootout with him. Um, and it's unclear, but... Uh, it seems that he may have blown up his house, his own house, in the last Theodorian act. And he and the people that were with him died there. Mm -hmm. um, so we knew that something big had happened overnight. There was General Amman's house was completely, basically demolished. Um, so we went to our relative's um, home for the luncheon the next day. And that was the talk of the town, of course, what happened to General Amman and so on. Um, and while people were picking food from the buffet, uh, Radio Ethiopia came on and began to list all the ministers and the princes and who, you know, all these names went down the list. And because people had been talking, they hadn't heard the first part, but they just heard this list of names of people that were imprisoned. And, um, at the very end, they said that Abu Tagir the Gentles Gumbachwal or something of that sort, being that revolutionary steps had been taken against them and it was forbidden to ask for their bodies. Wow. Uh, one of those people on their list, on that list, his sister was in that room with us. And I remember her dropping her plate. And I. I just remember the silence um, because everyone in that room knew multiple people on that list of people. And it was shocking and scary, you know, as children to have just be whisked home and, you know, seeing people so distraught, it was, um, it was scary. And things only went downhill from there. Um, you know, the, the red terror um, followed not long after and the white terror where the government in its red terror responding to the white terror launched by other Marxist groups against the government. Um, it was a bloodbath uh, for several years. And uh, it, it really shapes um, the way you think and the way you behave. Uh, Ethiopians uh, of that generation are very circumspect and um, don't often share what they feel. And I think a lot of that comes from the trauma and the fear that, you know, speaking freely um, has consequences. Um, and I think it affects a lot of us. Uh, it's, it's part of our collective memory. Ethiopians have always been very reserved, I think. But I think that era um, has made us more reticent uh, less willing to be involved, less willing to put our neck out um, for, for things. And I think it played a big role in having people step back and allowing people in power to, to do what they wanted. Um, I think it's played a huge role in that. Yeah, preservation mode or survival yeah. mode kicks yeah. in. And instead, you're right, the history of, I think, the monarchy and the court intrigue, which I've often compared to the Game of Thrones, especially Zemin and Masafin, the, the era of rulers or princes. Yes. Um, but, and, and, and the clergy culture, for that matter, the formal Orthodox religion, 
and of course the undercover sorcery which i've compared to santeria in, in the latin tradition that, yeah, that we have yeah. there's some uh, scary stuff there and 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 also within even within the dogma of the of the church the controversies there's the the, the sus ludet controversy the the kabat and the Sagat, all these things that you hear about and you know people don't really want to talk about heresy even yeah. in the church um, but it's important to know about them. What were they about? Why were they not accepted? Um, you know, the, 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 a, a lot of people talk about, for example, Emperor Johannes IV and Emperor Minet, and then, then uh, Nugus Minetic of Shah uh, convening the, the, the Council of Borumeda. A, a lot of uh, the focus there uh, among people nowadays, historians especially, is about, oh, you know, Emperor Johannes IV, ordered the, the, the people of Wallo, you know, more specifically the nobility of Wallo to all convert to, to Orthodox Christianity or lose their mm -hmm. life. And that's the big focus. But actually Moromeda was was actually directed against the Sosledet heresy in, in, in Shah and the need to 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 uh, make sure that the entire church conformed to a single dogma. And uh, that was actually the focus uh, that that Johannes the Fourth brought to it. And um, but people seem to 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 to, to forget that. Um, but yeah, the church, the, the history of the church is as fascinating and as 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 Game of Thronesh as 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 the as oh, the, yeah. of the monarchy as well. Our sister Orthodox churches would be horrified if they knew about <laughs> the three births and the grace and the anointment. For me, yeah. the one that made me spit my water out one time, it was very late into my adulthood, eight five six years ago where a bishop told me, uh, or maybe I read it in a book first, and then I heard experiences from some bishops who had spent time in uh, one of my favorite monasteries I've never been to, but I have family buried at Waldeba in the 5th century monastery, yeah. 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 Uh, right in the midst of the war area of uh, Wulkait right now, the disputed yeah. lands between the Amhara and the, the Tigray regions. This yeah. group called the Zatang Malakot, or the Nine Divinities, where through some, uh, y you know, I've often said that... Uh, Ethiopia historically was was kind of like a, a, an idiot savant, if you'll excuse the language, in terms of all humanities and what we lacked. And I think was more obvious why we needed the British and the American help in World War II was that our lack of STEM spending and, and studying finally caught up to us. It's like you can imagine our sages or our Likawans have you know sometimes several PhDs in yeah. study of music and poetry and in preaching but you know could not do three by three digit multiplication and that yeah. leads to people multiplying the trinity in weird ways to get <laughs> to nine yeah. persons yeah. of the trinity yeah and and you you have you have um human beings want an explanation for everything and 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 it's it's sometimes some things aren't that easy to explain so they'll they'll come up with theories um you know the 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 the, the source of that uh, heresy for example um was you know it it contradicts um, the whole concept of the unity of the Trinity and the equality of the Trinity, which is so integral uh, to Ethiopian Orthodox uh, belief. Um, but yet, it it the people who 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 followed this would argue it, you know, vociferously, and they would they would uh, quote scripture, and the same with the Kabat, and the same with the the Sagda. And you, um, there, there's at least one instance of, of, of an Ethiopian monarch, you know, adopting one of these heresies and saying, I'm going to follow that. But then when confronted by, you know, the, the church hierarchy saying, you know, how can you do this? He would say, you know, it's not because I don't like you guys or that I don't believe what you're saying. But I, this, this belief is very prevalent in this part of the country, in this particular mm -hmm. part of the country, and I need to squash the rebellion there. So... I'm going to say that I'm going to go with that because that way the people there will follow me. And, you know, th there's a certain political expediency also involved uh, in a lot of these. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting and it's fascinating. Um, but I have to say, uh, for the most part, our, our, our church fathers and, and our monarchs did a remarkable job in keeping the core of, 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 of both country and faith uh, and preserving it in a, in a way that you, they brought it down to us where, you know, to where 
with our Western and traditional educations, we're able to, to hold on to it and preserve it um, if we care enough, if we care enough. And it's, uh, I'm encouraged when young people like you and the many young deacons and, and priests in the West and people who are very interested in history and actually want to read rather than, you know, just listen to some anecdote and some distortion uh, and just repeat that. It really encourages me that there are people who are interested and I hope that continues. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, my narrative or my story of becoming a deacon and all that is, you know, it's impressive in its own way, but it, you know, it also needs some asterisks and, and qualifications. You know, I, I can't sing the liturgy like they want me to do it. You know, when, when I've done, I predominantly will just do either the English liturgy or if I do the Giz liturgy, I'll, I'll go in as the associate deacon and I'll, I'll, I'll say the stuff in Amharic or in Giz without melodies, you know, and it throws some priests who are not accustomed to that really off. If you ask me to sing the Giz liturgy, uh, I'm going to be in trouble and the people hearing me are going to be uh, in trouble. But you, I imagine, because uh, you were in the capital city at the most prestigious parish, you know, you, you had some higher standards held to you. But what's funny wow. is the, the degree to which, you know, you're able to fully assimilate into Western society and speak English, and yet within that context become a deacon, maybe maybe I'm lacking the knowledge, but I would imagine that that must be rare for your time and place for someone who went to these private American and British schools to be steeped also in the good is right tradition or in the church tradition. Uh, it was it was seen as backwards by a lot of people I have heard from the generation right before you, which would have been my parents' generation and, and even in the generation after you. So I, I, I can't imagine your generation was uniquely prepared. What do you attribute your not just love of, you know, Ethiopian history, but actually being raised in the church? And I, I don't know, you could tell me at that time, but I imagine it was more predominantly Giz and and transitioning into Amharic at that time still, but but slowly. Um, well, um, let, let me correct you in in, in, in a couple of things. Um, I am far from proficient in in, in singing the liturgy. Um, if you came to our to our church, I mean, I I'm passable, uh, but but I'm far from proficient. Um, now remember, I've been in here in the U.S. Uh, for for. Well, I won't say how many decades, <laughs> several decades, and uh, it's it's uh, and a good portion of that time was uh, you know I I have been uh, okay I'll say this I've been in New York City um, for for about thirty years and I have been a deacon at our church here in New York for about that time, for the full length of that time. Uh, before that, there were several years in which I was in Southern New Jersey um, in high school and living with my aunt and uncle there. Uh, where we had no Ethiopian church near us, we occasionally went to a Coptic church, and I, you know, was far out of practice with with with, with the liturgy. Um, and on top of that, you know, we we really value beautiful voices in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and my voice is far from beautiful. But um, you know, I may, they they make do with me. Um, but as you know, there's so much more to being a deacon than simply singing the liturgy. Uh, but um, that said, going back to, 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 to your actual question, um, yes, so my family were, were very devout or are very devout. My father was, was, um, was a lifelong devout churchgoer. He went to church every day. Now, he attended liturgy whenever he could, which was most days of the week. Uh, but if he was particularly busy with his job, he would maybe just go kiss the door of the church and then go to work. He was, uh, in, you know, for the benefit of your, your viewers, my father was a jeweler. He was a fairly well-known jeweler um, in Addis Ababa. His father was a jeweler. His grandfather was a jeweler. And wow. they were all associated with the imperial court. Uh, my grandfather worked in the palace as a jeweler. His father and his father-in-law as well both worked in the palace as jewelers. My great uncles uh, worked there. Um, so my father... Um, you know, came from a long line of people who worked in gold and jewelry. Uh, but he was a lifelong devout Orthodox Christian. And um, Saturday and Sunday never missed a liturgy, never. 
uh, Monday to Friday, most liturgies he was at. Not all of them, but whichever ones he could go to. Uh, he was very devout. And um, in, in right after the revolution, um, when people were, you know, continually going on strike for this cause or that cause, uh, it was a revolutionary atmosphere in Addis at the time. Um, the deacons of Holy Trinity Cathedral, where my father went to church every week, um, went on strike repeatedly. Um, and the reason that they would go on strike was, we want so-and-so taken off from the administration of the cathedral. So previous to that, uh, the dean of the cathedral had been Dika Sultana Hapta Mariam Warkana, who was um, also our family confessor. And he actually named me Salamun. Uh, later, he, absolutely, yes, he became an archbishop much later. But at the time, he uh, at the time of the revolution, he had been the emperor's advisor on religious uh, matters, church matters, in his special cabinet, not on the actual cabinet, but in the emperor's special cabinet. And uh, he was one of the first clergymen uh, to be arrested and put in prison. When he was in prison, there was a succession of people that was put in uh, in office in the Lika Sultanat or the Dean of the Cathedral's office. Um, and each one was removed because the deacons would go on strike. They didn't want Abba, you know, so-and-so, we don't want Abba, so-and-so, we're gonna go on strike. We're not gonna say the liturgy unless he leaves the church. So there were occasions where people would be assembled for holy liturgy and they'd have to wait until, you know, the Dean decided, okay, I'm gonna leave, you know, and they wouldn't start liturgy. So this, you know, these deacon strikes um, really irritated people like my father who would come. They're very devout. They want to come and pray. And the liturgy is not being held or not being held in a timely manner because of these strikes. So a few of them got together um, and took us, their children, to the patriarch, to Bizwagundus Avuna Teklahemanot at the time, newly enthroned, and said, we'd like you to ordain our children. We had next to no ecclesiastic learning. We didn't know anything at that time. We were little kids, literally little kids. Um, but the patriarch was aware of what was going on, um, and he knew what they were doing, so he ordained us. And the next time the deacons said they were going on strike, there we were. They we brought us out, put us in robes that were way too big for us. And, you know, we didn't know how to ring the bell correctly. We didn't know how to sing, but there were people there to guide us. The strikes stopped. You crossed the picket line. <laughs> we, we, we were there to destroy that picket line. And uh, what happened, um, we became very popular. People really loved seeing us there because it was all these young little kids that would come in and it was very endearing, I guess. Um, but, you know, we were put on duty to distribute holy water, to take the Bible around to be, to be kissed and uh, to, to, to take part in processions. I have this great photograph where I'm holding a candle in front of the, the three arcs, the three tablets of, of uh, Holy Trinity Cathedral, which is one tablet, of course, the Holy Trinity. The other is Kidana Meret, Our Lady uh, Covenant of Mercy and St. John the Baptist. Those are the three tablets that are in Holy Trinity Cathedral. Uh, and the three tablets are behind me and I'm walking in front of them. And one of the tablets is being carried on the head of, uh, of the future patriarch, Abana Mercurius. And uh, it's, uh, it's really great that I have this picture. Um, but yeah, so we, we, my generation of deacons, or my little group of deacons uh, that were ordained around the same time and went into service at the same time, went in in order to establish some kind of order again in a church that was going through a very rough time. Um, the things were very, very difficult and, and there was a need to, to, to come together and to build the strength of the church. And what was happening in that time in Ethiopia was really remarkable. Church attendance went way up. In wow. most, uh, you know, communist countries, you, there's a pattern of church attendance going down because of persecution. In Ethiopia, it was the opposite. The churches were packed constantly. Um, the, the patriarch who, who had been enthroned um, when uh, His Holiness uh, Abuna uh, Theophilos was, was taken to, uh, 
prison and eventually executed, the new patriarch Abu Nafak Laiman was an intensely holy man. He was, um, he was, he was just really something else. He he had no pockets. He refused to have pockets thrown in his clothes <laughs> because he really really believed in the doctrine that that a monk should have complete poverty. His his uh, his salary that he received. Uh, was used to raise uh, famine orphans in the in the patriarchate. He didn't wear shoes. He had the thinnest of sandals, and you know I've seen him eat. You know he would only eat boiled grains and nufro and, and, and you know just dry things. You know he was really um, a person who was just uh, at another level of holiness, and it, it was very inspiring to a lot of people. And and people do turn to God in times of trouble, and those were very troubled times. Mm -hmm. um, so you know we witnessed um, a lot of devotion and 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 uh, a, a, a coming together. So that tied us, I think, more firmly to to the to our roots. Um, you know the the importance of the church. It was almost a defiance to actually. To, to go to church in those days. And uh, as you said, it was regarded as, as backward for, for quite a while. Um, people were into westernizing and modernizing for many years. And then when the Doug came to power, it all became about, you know, Sovietizing everything. Uh, a person that was very high up in government, very, very, very high up in government at the time, um, used to frequent the Hilton Hotel. Um, uh, maybe some watch people viewing might come to you know to figure out who he was um, just by that information but he was very senior um he would come to the hilton my father had a store in the hilton and so you know my dad would often take us there to swim and uh you know we spent our days there and uh he noticed one day we came in and we were all carrying our net on us because we had just been to Kandase class at, at holy trinity it was a saturday and, and we were all carrying our net on us and, and this very senior member of the dedic asked my father oh where were your kids they're all carrying net on us and, and and he said oh um they were at church learning Kandasi." and he said what on a saturday why don't you take them to learn you know science but take them to biology tutor or something, you know, something useful. This is, you know, what are they going to do with that? And my father responded, you know, I want my kids to grow up to be good Ethiopians. Um, he said, I want my kids to grow up to be good Ethiopians that know what it is to be Ethiopian. He said, because, you know, you people are, are bad to, to your own country, <laughs> the foreigners in your own country. And uh, this very high official he knew my dad and he knew my dad was fairly unspoken. He did, Shh, don't say that anymore. Don't say that to anybody else. <laughs> but um, it was it was very um, useful in rooting us. I mean, like I said, I went to schools that were run by British people and American people. It would be very easy to become completely disconnected. But I think um, our experience at the time about what was going on in our country and the way that I was introduced to um, service in the church uh, played a big role in rooting me and, and people like me into our, into, both into our faith and into our patriotism as well, Ethiopian patriotism. I, I think so too. You actually had a taste of the regime that was that 3000 year institution, you know, give or take with its own ups and downs and upheavals, as you said. Me, I was totally separated from it. The only advantage I have is that I was raised by parents and a lot of their brothers, sisters, whatever, who had literally uh, not seen it. My mom visited a couple times during the Dedic period, but my father literally did not even visit Ethiopia during that period and both left before the fall of Emperor Haile Selassie. And so, you know, I would notice from the different waves of of immigrants of Ethiopians, even the change in the Amharic, you know, in the in the beginning, it's very Italian focused. You get a loan word like Corenti, and over time, you get electric, you know, for the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, my parents and stuff say things like like that. Uh, Dedic folks say 
كف الهاكر اند هاديك فوكس سي كل يو نو اي وود نوتس ذيس ثينجز اي واز لايك اوه ذيس از وين ذيس بيرسون كيم جست فروم ذا واي ذات ذي سبيك اند سام تايمز بيبل وود وود مارك اون ذا واي ذات اي وود سبيك يو نو فيرست ذي وود ميك فون اوف ات بيكوز اي وين اي واز فيري يونغ اي دينت نو اني كاس ووردز اذر ذان يو نو باليغي اند اذر ثينجز ذات ماي بيرنتس وود كول مي سو ذي ثوت ات واز جريت بت ذن اذر امهارك اي وود يوز ذي وود لوك ات مي لايك اتس اركايك اور سام ثينج ذا فيرست تايم اي Well, not the first time, but maybe the second time I went back to Ethiopia. I went back just very few times. I left Ethiopia in 1981, um, and I went back just a couple of times. And the, I think it was the second or third time I went back, I went into a store and was just talking to a, to a woman. And she said, <laughs> um, you're, you're, you're speaking in such old Amharic. And I, <laughs> it's very true. Um, you, another, another thing I, I noticed Um, a lot of people that grew up in the Dari period and, and since then uh, will refer to the region or the province as Gondar. But those of us who remember from before call it Begimdar, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you, you, and, and, and now it's all Amarak, which is no. a much larger area. For now. But yeah. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, It, it's it, there's definitely been a lot of change and i think one of the things that i've noticed is that people uh, diaspora ethiopians um also i think are divided into groups um mm -hmm. there are the old diaspora which which came out immediately after the revolution then there's another wave that came out um like uh, right about the time that derg fell and and the eprdf uh, came to power Uh, and then there are the more recent ones, um, which are, you know, people that came with the diversity lottery or mm -hmm. other people and, and came. And, and, and the experiences of all three groups are, 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 are similar and different at the same time. And you can tell them by language, by, by mannerisms. Uh, there are just many ways that you can identify um, certain groups of people. Um, it is very interesting. Um, I think the people who come in more recently uh, tend to be much more entrepreneurial. They want to go into business. They want to do more unorthodox things. They want to, uh, they, they're much more open to experimenting. Uh, and then the older groups value much more traditional um, approaches, whether it's in your education, everybody should be a doctor or a, a lawyer, um, you know, and, and, you know, if somebody says they, they want to be an artist, um, it's probably not going to go over very well. <laughs> um, uh, somebody decides they're going to be a musician. Um, so, you know, th there are ways of, you know, I think the different eras and the different ways of thinking associated with those eras are, are, are apparent even in, in the diaspora, in you know, the Ethiopian diaspora. And it's, it's, it's very interesting, but I think, You know, as much as I am a product of, I am that last generation that was born right before the, the, the fall of the monarchy, right? Um, I do, like you said, I do remember um, things. I remember, uh, I actually remember seeing the emperor from the balcony of, you know, there was an upstairs balcony to my dad's shop. And I remember it was, I forget what anniversary of his coronation, but he went by in his open car. And I remember the crowds in the street, the... A little time, the cheering as he went by, and people on the other balconies throwing confetti down towards him. Um, I, I, I remember that, and um, it's something that I saw. And you know, it's people. You, you can still see it, you know, via video clips on mm -hmm. YouTube. But um, seeing it in person, experiencing it in person, you know, is it's it's unique. Um, and I remember the huge parades during the dark time. You know the. The, the May Day parades and the Revolution Day parades and the and you know the the, the cheering and and, and uh, the mafakir you know where you you would denounce the body as a flat tire you know uh, <laughs> just you know these are all things that you know we experienced um, as you know you know firsthand so you know it helps you know when when people nowadays you know it's it's funny I, I was watching a program. Uh, from Addis, where somebody was asked on the street who the first emperor of Ethiopia was. And the person um, responded, uh, <laughs> the first emperor. Uh, 
you know, it, there's, there's, there's really, it, it's, it's really a shame that, that, that uh, Ethiopian history and Ethiopian culture isn't, isn't taught more um, in the schools. I mean, Emperor Selassie was a big figure, but he's far from the first emperor. He's actually the last reigning emperor. So you, um, you, you, you can tell that there is, that a lot of the problems today come from ignorance, from not knowing what came mm -hmm. before not knowing you know what made ethiopia what 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 ethiopia comes out of there's no knowledge of that so what they hear now is oh you speak a certain language so you know everyone who doesn't speak your language should be out from your area you should drive them out um so and so oh is an oppressor send them back to where they came from where did they come from? They may that person may have been in your region for five, six, ten generations. You don't know, um, just because they don't happen to speak your language, or they, or you perceive them to be something other than you. Um, so you know, I think it's so important for for Ethiopians to know their history, to know their culture, um, to know about other cultures within the larger culture. Uh, it's very important um, whether it is, you know, you, you need to know about what your Muslim neighbors believe, what their traditions are, uh, what, what, you know, people of other ethnicities do. It doesn't mean that anybody is superior to anyone else. It just means that it's part of a larger identity. The Ethiopian identity is larger than any ethnic group, than any, any single uh, uh, creed. Um, it, it's something that unites everybody. And that's what people seem to have lost um, because there is very narrow thinking and it comes from a lack of knowledge. I, I really believe that. Absolutely. They, they don't understand that there were no blood tests done. This is what I say. Ethiopia has a very interesting balance of what you know I called hereditary or blood and merit. And really the strongest blood case is if you want to be executive of the entire country but you could be even executive of Bagemder without yeah. a blood case <laughs> you know the, 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 it's a huge huge amount of property and territory yeah yeah and and you know yes you you th there was a requirement that you can trace your lineage to king solomon and the queen of sheba and actually the 1955 constitution says the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. It's the Queen first. Um, you know, we, we, we were that proud of who we were, where they put our queen before the, the um, it, it may be an aside, but yeah. I, I would criticize the 30s and 50s constitutions and wish we had stuck with the Fatana guest. The, the, that's a very good point. I think um, more of what was ours should have been retained. Um, and I think a lot of the experimenting uh, with, with these outside influences, um, you know, had a, hurt us a great deal, I think. It really did hurt us a great deal. The coups you talked about, and I think are inherently linked to that, and some of the maneuvers of the British and the Americans, um, you know, our mutual friend, uh, Elias, over at Sahai Publishers, he, I mean, he traced it back to some of the stuff at Minelik with the Turks and with the with the Germans under, um, uh, in the prior prior to the Nazis, prior to World War One, um, and uh, with Wilhelm, and that's that's I, I hadn't gone back that far, but at least to those that fifties Constitution and thirties Constitution, y you see that the Western so-called democracies are arm twisting the proud monarchy of Ethiopia to be less monarchical, which, you know, leads to, I think, the, the 60s Noai Brothers coup, which then, you know, later to the to the later coup, finally, that, that led to the ultimate communist revolution that you're you're talking about. And we're, you and I are both a member of that historical photos from the Horn of Africa. And it, yeah. it's been very interesting. The, the gentleman who shares the same name as my father and whose son shares my three names. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> by the way, yeah. wow. there's another Henok Elias Nagash. It's not just You're me. Kidding me. He's oh. in Los Angeles, just like me, and we haven't met yet, but he's... Uh, oh, that must lead to so much confusion. Oh, my. I, you know, we've never 
cross paths, but the big confusion is between his father and my father. A lot of people have confused their names and they're totally different, but they're from the same generation. And that gentleman has posted a lot of photos. He had some family ties to the Noai brothers. And, and I've seen some of the interesting conversations that have, have oh, been. I know who you're talking about. Okay, yeah. yes, 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 of course, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, he, um, so as, as uh, you know, more information to, you know, bringing it back to, to me again, of course. <laughs> but uh, my my grandfather um, died in that coup. He uh, was an imperial guard. He's I didn't know that. Oh yeah, he's uh, he was a major. He was Shalek uh, Ashfar Rao Ayano. He was uh, the administer uh, administrator of the Imperial Guard Hospital, and he was a senior officer in in in, uh, in, in the Imperial Guard, and he was very close to General Mengistu. So he, he died in the coup. In fact, there's um, there's at least one account that says that he may have been the first person to die wow. in that coup. Um, he was found in the same room with General Sengay Dibu. Um, the circumstances aren't very clear whether General Sengay killed him and then someone came and killed General Sengay immediately after, but they were the first two casualties as far as we know. Um, but um, to, to, to go back to your point, um, there was a, a, a desire, um, especially among the, 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 the younger uh, modernizer generation of, of, of nobles initially, no, nobility, um, mm -hmm. that wanted change um, and, and were pushing for change. And they, they came in and they wrote the 1930s constitution and the 1955 constitution was an update of that basically. Um, where they were trying to bring Western values and 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 Ethiopian uh, traditions into some kind of of, of uh, a system that would work. Now, um, it you know you could argue that it you know of course it, that it failed, um, but I think it could have been done differently. Um, I, I remember talking with with someone here in New York who I really respected. Uh, um, who, who, you know, we were talking about as a Tekla Georgis the first. Uh, as a Tekla Georgis uh, was an emperor in the the the, the, uh, in the Gondar uh, when the Gondar line of the dynasty was was in power. Um, he was one of the he's, he's often called Fitzami Mengist uh, mm -hmm. because uh, the Zaman Masafin really took off um, once he lost the last vestiges of power that he had. Uh, as Ithak Georgi is, 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 is noted in Ethiopian history for being enthroned and dethroned five times. He, <laughs> he, he was on and off the throne and, uh, you know, largely because the warlords, this warlord wanted him on, then this warlord took him off. And it was just a very tumultuous time. But initially, um, he, his troubles, his particular troubles began because he waged, he, he imposed a tax on honey. In Begimdir. And Begimdir traditionally had been exempt from those types of taxes. And the appeal to him, the, the nobility of Begimdir appealed to him saying, you know, we can't do this. But he needed the income because the, the, the imperial coffers were depleted and he really needed funds. So he, he insisted that this would need needed to be done. Um, so they assembled at Devre Tabor, the nobility, and they asked the Indarasi, who was supposed to function as kind of his chief advisor, as emperor's mm -hmm. chief advisor. Uh, they, they, they approached him and said, we don't want to be ruled by the emperor anymore. We will be ruled by you as long as you consult with us. And uh, Ras Guksa the Great, who was the first Wadrasha um, Indarasi, uh, agreed. And uh, Atwa Maha pointed out to me that this could have been Ethiopia's Magna Carta movement, moment, right? Uh, the, the, the nobility were the ones that got together and said, we want you to rule us in consultation with us. You would, you would be in charge and we would advise you, right? They would keep the emperor on his throne. So they were, they were making the emperor a symbol and the Indarasi, who is, you know, de facto prime minister, as you would, would consult this parliament. So we were having actually a native born system 
of constitutional monarchy, right? It was, the, it was our Magna Carta moment. It didn't work out because warlordism took over and the country fragmented. Um, and thankfully, there was still the uniting influence of a monarch, no matter how symbolic and weak he was, there was a monarch in Gondar who everyone recognized as the emperor. And there was the Orthodox Church also helped in keeping things from completely breaking apart. Um, but we had other moments where we could have developed native solutions to the problems that we had rather than trying to import things first from the West then from the Eastern Bloc, which I think have led to, you know, rather serious problems uh, in our country. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's very interesting the way you presented it because it, it still wouldn't be, you know, quite what you see elsewhere with ever expanding suffrage. If I take the American example, because I'm an American, you see early on very limited suffrage, you know, white male property owners, as it's popular to say nowadays, and it increasingly expands to all these diverse groups. And what you're talking about now is a very, very narrow group. And it would be interesting, would it stay? It wouldn't be what people would desire, but it would be more organic and native and maybe thus more long lasting. Um, I think a, a component besides the symbol, which differentiates it from somewhere like Britain, which hasn't functionally, you know, had a real monarchy since the end of the 17th century, it, it still had this, this will to rule. You know, it's become popular, and I, I think mainly because of left dominance of the narrative in history, to get away from the great men theory of history and get to this kind of systems thinking where everything is just systems. And I think like with a lot of other issues, it's not one or the other, it's a balance. But if you ask me what tips the scale, I think the great men of history definitely tips the scale, but that to deny systems and certain moments would be ridiculous. So you laid the groundwork to talk about this system and then you get Emperor Theodore who comes in and, you know, how many Emperor Theodores are there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he, 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 he's undoubtedly one of the greatest figures in our history. He was very controversial in his time. Um, we look back at him much more fondly than people in his time looked at him. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, things are always um, more clear to you when you look back at them uh, than when you're actually living in them. Uh, he, he, he was a man that was born well before his time, I think. Um, he, he, he did a lot. He, if, if, if Kyodros II hadn't emerged, um, I don't think we would be sitting here today saying Ethiopia was the only country in Africa that was never colonized, because I think Agreed. there's a very good chance, not only would we be colonized, but we would probably not be colonized by one country, we'd probably be split up um, yeah. between various interests. So I think you know Ethiopians um, owe Theodros II a great deal. Um, uh, and he, you know, he, I think, you know, he does, he does get a lot of credit, but I don't think people really realize what a visionary he was. Um, you know, his, he, 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 he wanted to build a, a boat on, on Lake Tana, which, the, you know, with an engine and everything. And, you know, just being able to have that vision, um, you know, in a country that hadn't seen anything motorized, never until uh, up to that point. Um, it's really remarkable. He was truly a man ahead of his time. And I, you know, it's funny that you should bring him up. I'm actually, you know, working on something about him right now, but, you know, he, um, he was, he was many things. He was a very complex character. He was truly what, you know, he truly falls into what you just referred to as like the great man theory. Um, and I think when we look at Ethiopian history, there are great men as Isaiah, as in Bedemarium, um, 
از ای دگمای از ای تیودروس از ای هاندس از ای مینلیک از ای هایلس لاسی all of them had their own contribution um, very different men each of them from from the other but they all did something monumental uh, for their country um, so yeah I, I definitely agree um, when when people criticize the past system in Ethiopia as feudalistic and, and you know dictatorial and so on you know I always I always want I always point to people and you know try to point to um, things that that they assume that are not necessarily true you, we, we say you know we're more equal now because there isn't a monarchy but are we actually have we gotten rid of all class structure clearly not um, not everybody in Ethiopia is a ruler um, there's still a small group of people that run the show it's actually less representative of the of the population than the people that ruled us before the revolution I mean um, the, 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 the monarchy was not, as you pointed out, not all hereditary aristocrats. The, there were hereditary aristocrats, but all titles were life titles in Ethiopia. There are very few strictly hereditary titles. There was the emperor, there was the Wagshun, um, there were a couple of others. There was the, you know, the Jan Parabs of Ambassad, but most others, the Rases, the Dejaz matches, the Graz matches, what have you, they were appointed for life. If your father was a Ras, you could be just plain Lij or Akul. You could be a Dejaz much, and then your child could be a, a Ras. It all depended on service, service. And there were people from very humble backgrounds that were raised to very powerful positions. Um, not so much now. Um, power circles have become smaller um, since, since the revolution than they were before. Um, and I, th I don't think people realize that. Um, they really don't realize that they, they, in their mind, they think that the emperor ran the whole country and his children and, you know, just a few, you know, people that were related to him ran everything, which was not the case. Not at all. It's, it's really hard for them to fathom that. I hate, I haven't finished it, but I'm going through, you know, the hilarious blending of history and fiction of Risard Kapusinski's and he, oh. He, he, but, but it, it, you know, it has these points that are relevant, you know, because it'll highlight real things like, you know, if someone falls out of favor with the emperor, uh, he'll get someone from humble beginnings, sometimes in spite of the people with yeah. less humble beginnings. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and, you know, that is a, that is kind of a greater truth that's preserved through the, the sort of, you know, the funny narrative that this guy, uh, who was a Polish communist uh, journalist <laughs> wrote yeah. this. Uh, I mean, there's truth to be found in there, to be gleaned in there, as long yes. as you understand and, and, where and it's I coming from. I will say from. something about Kapuscinski's book. It's beautifully written. He, he's an amazing writer. It's beautifully written. Um, it's just, you know, there's truth in it, but it's a work of fiction. Um, and the people actually believe some of those things as facts. Um, they believe people, you know, ministers were hiding behind the trees, cowering in fear, you know, and jumping out, you know, only when called. And it's not, you know, not something that happened. And there was something about a gymnastics class that they were all taking with the emperor. Things, you know, uh, things that people take as fact now. Um, because Kapuscinski, you know, he did, he did eventually say that actually he was basing it on Poland and, and it wasn't really stuff that happened in Ethiopia and so it's on. It's like an allegory. Yeah. <laughs> like and, Orwell's pigs in exactly, Animal Farm. Exactly. But why use Haile, Emperor Haile Selassie and why use, you know, he, he named specific people in that yeah. book that did exist, but put them in jobs that maybe were not what they were actually doing. Um, but it's a, it, it is a, it's a, I thought it was a really well-written book, uh, just fictional. Um, but, you know, the, the, but you, as you said, there are truths to be found there. Um, was Ethiopia, you know, some kind of utopia before the revolution? No, um, there were lots of issues. Um, you know, there's a there's an interesting story about uh, Prince Sahaila Sindasi, who was the emperor's youngest son. Um, he he was um, kind of a, a, a 
he was of an artistic bent. He was he was one of these people, you know, he grew up in Britain, basically. He, he was five years old when they went into exile and then came back later, um, you know, he was you know, he was schooled in Britain uh, and came back after the liberation to a country, you know, that, you know, found him strange because he, he grew up, you know, in, in Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, and anything that was from outside was strange. And this was a, you know, essentially a boy who had grown up amid Westerners with Western values and so on. And I think he he realized the stresses that were that were uh, that were coming up um, between modernity and the Western uh, manner of living and the way it was being introduced into Ethiopia. And he actually made a, a, a movie. He made a film. Um, no way. Yeah, he made a film. Uh, it was about um, just that issue. Uh, the clash between traditional Ethiopia and and modernity and westernization that was happening. And uh, interestingly, you know, this is the, the emperor's son. He's a prince. He's an imperial highness. His movie was, was banned. It was censored. <laughs> Uh, because it was the, the, the government concluded that it was a criticism of official policy and it was banned. It, it was never released. Um, I don't know if it exists still. I imagine that it might, but it would really be interesting to see. Um, you know, there, there, there's, there's many little moments like that in Ethiopian history, which, which um, I just wish people knew more about. Um, there are a lot of people and a lot of figures that did many very interesting things um, and had unique ways of, of looking at things that perhaps, you know, we should revisit in, in, in many ways. Uh, I think, you know, and, and Prince Haris Lassi is one of them. Um, it's, it's, you know, but it, it's interesting that even the emperor's son wasn't able to, 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 to voice you know, that class, you know, to talk about that clash and the problems it might bring. I would love to see that movie. Uh, I'm sure it has a lot to say to us today. Uh, so would I. I didn't even yeah. know it existed. That would be an amazing uh, thing to see. Internet, do your magic. Those of you who are listening to this podcast, if you can find it somehow, get it to if Deacon Salamon and I. If you, if you have this clip, please, because I, I think they have a huge collection of, of those things, you know, films and stuff that were censored and, and locked away. Uh, that that's right it's it's very interesting because the the communist censorship is is kind of plain but the monarchical one it, it was a little harder to understand it was a little more wrapped in the court intrigue we're talking about but both ends of the spectrum have their own anti-state what they would call propaganda that they want to get rid of. And it's interesting to know both of those things. I've been taking more time to read the Chronicles because I think the main history is there. But there is something to the left's idea of this, like, farmer's history and the, the sort of the regular folks, you know. Maybe the most popular version in the United States is the Howard Zinn style. And, you know, he, he sparked a whole revisionist history movement, although he wasn't the first to do so. There were other people who did so about the wars and, and such. But, you know, your father, as you said, was one of these figures that <laughs> was courageous against even these this communist leadership. Yes, uh, my heart well. left when you said that, you know. <laughs> uh, he, 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 was, he, was, he, was, he, he was really, truly fearless. Um, I remember one time, you know, I had friends who, who lived in on the campus of Addis Ababa's uh, building college or the architectural school of the university, and they lived on the campus. So he he took my brother and I to go to their house to, to play, and we came in the front gates. And in those days in Addis, you know, everybody got searched no matter where you went. And so stopped the car, and they asked him if he had guns. And, you know, Masari Adbuta, he said, was I supposed to bring one? He was just one of these people that was just completely fearless. Um, and, you know, he's, he's lucky uh, that he got away with a lot of things that maybe other people wouldn't have been able to get away with. But he, he had, um, 
he had he was a he was a man of faith and he had complete faith and he was fearless because of it um but he was also you know um, he was smart and he knew he he knew that that there were times that he needed to keep silent mm -hmm. uh, and you know the, i think ethiopians have learned to become survivors that's one thing that we are we are survivors um and we we emerge from a lot of things maybe stronger than we were but you know he, he he you know he he was a part of a generation that i think did westernize very very you know quickly and, and and embraced you know this new modernized western world but then came back and said you know there's value in our traditions uh and embraced that as well and he was he was a very patriotic ethiopian and very devout uh person as i already said and uh, I was lucky. I was lucky in him and then in my mom and also, you know, in the friends that they had and the relatives we had. Um, you know, our, your, your village really helps to, to, to form you, your, your community. And I was very lucky in my village, so to speak. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the, the point you made about um, history not just being about, you know, the great figures, but also the common people of those eras. It's very, very true. When when you when you look at history, um, it's more than just you know dates and huge events like battles and you know constitutional conventions and coronations. Um, it, a lot of history is the history of just the common people, the famines, the droughts. Um, you know the mass migrations whether it's forced or you know you know uh, you know forced by battle or forced by economic conditions um or whether you know everything has an impact on on history and it's the story of people it's the the story of experiences and yes great men and great women uh do have a huge effect on these stories but it's not the full story. Um, and, you know, the, the, the stories of our emperors and our bishops and patriarchs and, and, you know, our great lords and warriors is not the whole story. Um, there are many levels to Ethiopian history and, and, and world history, for that matter. Uh, and it's important to examine them. And, of course, perspective is, 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 is also important. You can look at an event from the you know, from the side of the victor or the side of the defeated, and your your impression be completely different. Um, the way somebody sees 1916 in Ethiopia, if they are pro Emperor Selassie, and the way they see it, they are pro Lizzie Yasu is probably vastly different. Um, yeah, we didn't mention that that coup. There's still more I need to learn about that, but it seems like there may be some <laughs> British American influence there too. Oh, there definitely was. There was, there were, that's, that's worthy of a movie. Um, there are doctors, there are doctored photographs um, of Liji Yasu. There were genuine photographs of Liji Yasu wearing Muslim garb, but there are other photographs that were doctored um, to make him look like he had converted to, to Islam. Now, had he converted to Islam? He may have. Uh, he may have, um, you know, said things. In fact, you know, he's quoted as having said things uh, to, to people that he was close to, saying things like, uh, you know, Christianity is just too difficult for me. I would much rather be a Muslim or an atheist because it's just simpler. Now, uh, in, in, in Ethiopia in those days, that would have, you know, Ethiopia today, if somebody said... <laughs> I don't know if I want to be a Orthodox Christian anymore. I think I'm going to become a Protestant or maybe a Muslim or, you know, I just decided I'm just going to give up on God entirely. You know, it wouldn't be, it would be a big deal within your families and your society, but I don't think people would think twice. It would just be, okay, this, this is whatever he thinks. But in Ethiopia in 1916, that was a huge deal. It was a huge deal. And that's the other thing. We need to look at history in the perspective of those times. Um, you know, when we're looking at what was done and what was said, 
and what happened in 1916 or 1816 for that matter. And we're looking at it with the values of people in, two, in 2021. Um, it doesn't work, you know, or say, oh, you know, they were, you know, that was so sexist. Oh, that was so elitist. You know, it's 1861 or 1816. Um, you know, it's, it's the values of the time are different. The conditions that people lived in, completely different. So you can't look at it from a perspective of 2021 when you're looking at 1816, right? So I think that has a big role in how people look at history. They judge things based on their current value, you know, values. Um, you need to be able to put yourself in the shoes of somebody living in 1816, if you're looking at 1860. Um, Absolutely. I often compare it to the Lebanese parliamentary system. I haven't kept on the most re recent politics, but last I checked, they have these sort of tokenized percentages Yes. For each, you know, Sunni Muslim, Shia Muslim, Orthodox Christian, you know, the the Maronite <laughs> Christian, yeah. and all these blends yeah. of, of the weird Armenian, Catholic and Orthodox. Like, you know, the Greek Catholic as opposed to the Roman, you know, Maronite. Yeah, stuff. and in our context, I tell people, you know, for most of Ethiopian history, you don't get to as an individual pick your religion the way you do in America, and that's yeah. so foreign because, you know, to unroot the enlightenment thinking in america you got to go back 250 years but to unroot enlightenment thinking in ethiopia you know give or take you just got to go back 50 to 100 years as we're yeah. talking about yeah. and emperor or lij yasu uh you know although he you know that one parent you know muslim one parent uh orthodox christian most people don't get a choice it's like whatever your family is it's a, it's a communal identity more than an individual one you know um yes. people may question emperor teodros himself you know i i think he was at least in some sense you know a believer what exactly that means uh for anyone who gets to that level of executive of a country and and balancing the things they've done and you know the impact of being uh, I'm going through the Tara Zenab's chronicle of him and, the, the, you know, the fact that he was in a monastery like many, many other rulers. You mentioned Emperor yeah. Zerayakob early yeah. on. And his yeah. monastery gets massacred. You know, yeah. that that yeah. might inspire how he behaves, uh, whether yeah. or not. It's funny because I was writing about exactly that um, just, you know, before we, we started talking. That experience, that, that sacking of the, the monastery, probably had a great deal to do because he was about 10 years old at the time and he he ran into the woods with some friends and hid for a few days and then came back to find everyone massacred um but he that had that was probably one of the formative events in his life that led him to 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 decide you know i need to do something about this mess that's in the country um it was one of the of the catalysts i believe uh, for Tudros II. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, he, he has he has a controversial um, uh, reputation as far as the church is concerned. I think, actually, that Tudros II was a very devout Christian. I think he was very devout to the Orthodox Church. His problem was with, he was, he was something, he was a little, I think he was our version of anti-clerical. He thought yeah. there was too much energy, <laughs> and he wanted to. He wanted land, and he wanted taxes. He wanted to take some land from the church to use to to generate income, so he would have a standing army that was salaried. Um, he couldn't do that without doing that, and he just thought that there were so many priests, and he just didn't see the reason why we needed so many priests. And um, you know, the in 1855 to say that in Ethiopia was beyond outrageous, right? It, it was shocking. And, uh, you know, he, the first, for the first time, I believe, for the first time in Ethiopian history, a, a, a Coptic Pope came to, to Ethiopia um, and, and visited. And one of the things he tried to do was to mediate between the Archbishop Abu Nesalama and, and the Emperor, Theodros II. And, he got accused of being a, an Egyptian spy, a, a, an Ottoman spy. He actually imprisoned him for a few days. So 
<laughs> these were shocking things for people. And yet, at the same time, this is a man who had the Qurata Rusul uh, icon over his bed. Because yes. He was so devout. Um, and he, he, uh, he was willful and he, he had uh, very different thinking than people of his time. And I think that's what gave him the reputation of, oh, he, he did. He, I actually saw a Western writer who wrote that he hated orthodoxy. And I actually, that, no, that's actually yeah. quoted on his, on his, um, uh, on his uh, Wikipedia page. And um, it really, that's why I really dislike Wikipedia. But it's on the page that he hated orthodoxy, which is not the case. Um, he that's just ridiculous. Yeah. The hierarchy, he thought, you know, things could be run a little differently. Um, it's what I said earlier. He had the real will to rule. He really believed in sovereignty. It ultimately got him in trouble with the British expedition and the Henry Blank account that you mentioned earlier, you know, Sarat Bahabashagar or the captivity in the Abyssinian country. Yes. And, you know, it's because he didn't believe in diplomacy and ambassadors. And, and frankly, those things didn't really exist in our concept because we had the concept of absolute monarchy and sovereignty and that that means you know he is the ultimate decider not anyone else and there's always been this complicated role of our emperors as defenders of the faith and emperor Haile Selassie in his own way did very made very radical changes against the desires of many clerics um the bishop of uh, southern california mr abuna bernavas is uh, the bishop at my church and he raised me in the faith for a long time he told me he was one of the first group of people who he would during the summers when he'd go away from his monastery to his family's house practice reading amharic it's weird for people to understand that native amharic speakers read only in guz and so yeah. he would he would come back and he was one of the first generation to begin reading amharic in the church and he says the sages or the, the elders of his time sneered in, at him and looked down at him and yeah. said, what is this guy reading the newspaper in the church? Because the only yeah. Amharic they've ever heard is the newspaper, not any yeah. holy uh, objects. No, I think I'm just Yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 that's very true. And, and you know, you, you don't even have to go back that far. You know, the, the Amharic, the Amharic, uh, translation of the Holy, Holy Bible is, is, is fairly recent. When you think about it, it's fairly recent. Um, we've had the Bible for centuries. And, you know, I, actually, as Kildros actually said that, you know, when, when, when missionaries arrived and, they, you know, he asked them what they did and they said, oh, we're here to preach, you know, the word of Christ. And he said, what? More priests? I have more, in a, more than <laughs> enough priests here. You know, I don't need any more priests. I need people who make guns. You know, can you make guns? And 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 uh, it, it's it's true. Uh, uh Metka's Antic of Blessed Memory was was one of the key people to bring Amharic liturgy, uh, you know, or liturgy in you know Amharic in the liturgy uh, to Holy Trinity Cathedral. Before then, you know, people would come to church. It was is from beginning to end. Um, but introducing Amharic into the liturgy was 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 very controversial at the time. Uh, and, and, and like you said, uh, as it was Abu Nabas pointed out, you know, change, uh, change is always problematic. And Emperor Selassie changed a lot. Um, Emperor Menelik changed a lot. Uh, you know, Isaac Yodros, of course, changed a lot. And, you know, maybe not as successfully as Isaac Menelik did or Isaac Selassie did. Um, you know, but Minilik, you know, a, a good example is, you know, when the first telephone was introduced uh, in, 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 in Addis, uh, late in Minilik's reign, um, the, the, the palace priests actually set it afire because they thought it was demonically possessed. <laughs> um, so, you know, when that happened, you know, he, he, he realized that, you know, he had to approach things a little more differently. So they brought a the fil first film projector um, to 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 the palace, you know, to, to show a film, and uh, they they said that that uh, um, 
and Permanente and Gus McConnell were so excited. You know, they said they were like boys. They were so excited to, to, to see this because they loved gadgets and, you know, like many of us do. And they were very excited to see this, but they were worried about what the priests would say, you know, to see this moving image, you know, on the wall. And what the, what the people, I forget who it was exactly that brought the projector, but he very cleverly brought a religious film and that depicted Christ walking on water. And there was no arguing, you know, that being demonic or anything. So, you know, um, they learned that there were ways to, 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 to introduce things, to, to institute change in a way that would be, you know, acceptable to, to the people of their times. Um, and some were more successful than others. Um, but I think the net result was a great deal of our culture got diluted and a great deal of our culture um, perhaps was was lost in 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 the in the eagerness to adopt mm -hmm. um, and to mimic uh, the culture of others and it's uh, it's something that that I think now I think people realize and I think there is a, a, there is a move to return to your roots to our roots and to find out you know what it is to be an Ethiopian. Um, as opposed to these other identities that have been artificially imposed. And I'm encouraged by that. I definitely am. Me too. The, a more slow, calculated, and contextual modernization than the hyper-modernization that, that took place. And one of another one of your recent posts that I would like you to talk about, but I want you to weave the story of your father again into this, you know, I, I knew your father was a jeweler. I didn't realize it was so intergenerational. It's so funny to me how I see so many professions are intergenerational. I know several families of what I could only call Levites, uh, including my own, although my, my father's generation was skipped. Uh, you know, it came back to me, my father's whole side, all his fathers, his mothers, uh, you know, if his mother could, she would have been a priest, but she was the daughter of a priest. His father was a deacon. His cousins yeah. are monks and marigitochen all these things but you see these families of uh, levites and, and jewelers that's so fascinating could you yeah. talk about some of the type of uh, artwork or constructions that your your father made and i think with that splendor talk about your recent post about the new year uh, with the is it the madegdeg i didn't even know that word yeah. and then and then it's Allah. yes yes so um, to, to go, going back to, to, to my family history, and you, you mentioned Levites and priestly families, but my, my father had those in his, in his mother's side of the family as well. But um, both sides of the family, uh, of my father's family, were jewelers. And uh, they, they were, you know, they, they found their, you know, their, their ancestry is from uh, Ankobeb and Tara, which is in northern Shaw. And uh, they are definitely been, my cousin. Yes, <laughs> it's it's all we're all very. It's I have so, never heard anyone else say Tara on this program. Only my funny. grandmother knows that village. My grandmother was yeah. born in that village. That yeah. is so funny. Oh, that is, is that right? Okay. You my know, mother's I, mother I, is born in Tara, and I, I most people don't even know it. Ankobar is very famous. Yes, but I have never heard anyone even know what that I was. I don't see it on any maps. You're the only person I've ever heard say it besides Since people in my family. Well, those of us who are from there know it. So <laughs> there you go. We probably are related that way. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, Tara and Ankobet, and they've always been associated with the the, the court of the, the Shawan kings. And, you know, eventually when they inherited the imperial throne, the you know, emperor's court as well. And uh, so my, my father, my great, my grandfather, my great grandfathers, both on my father's side, they are all, you know, jewelers. And my father's uncles are, my father's brothers are jewelers. And so it's a, it's a family, it's a family business. And my, my, my grandfather and my great uncles and my great grandfathers all worked in the palace from the time of Empress Zodi to onwards, they were in the palaces in Addis Ababa working as jewelers. So my father would, would go to visit his father at work and he would learn the trade from his father and his uncles there in the palace. And, you know, people from, you know, across the country would come and bring tribute in the form of gold or silver, you know, that was found, you know, people that were panning for gold or, 
or you know found silver on their lands and so on would give a portion of it to the palace as, as tribute to the emperor so there was precious metal metal to spare lying around so my father would would actually work on these things and he would do things like make a vase out of silver you know and and and, and give it to the emperor uh so there was a familiarity with the imperial family there and uh you know, the, they encouraged him, you know, they, 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 they thought it was great that he was thinking of the emperor, you know, so it was the emperor, the gold or silver or whatever, but he would, you know, beautify it, turn it into an object and, and give it. So when my father finished high school, um, he was sent on an imperial scholarship to go study jewelry, modern westernized jewelry design. He, he already knew the Ethiopian manner of doing jewelry. Uh, and he was sent to study what Western methods, and he was sent to uh, West Germany. He was sent to Dusseldorf in, in West Germany. Now it was Germany. Back then it was East and West. So he went to West Germany, and he studied jewelry design there. And you know he was uh, he his final exam was to, to 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 make a piece of jewelry, to market it and to sell it. And that was their final exam to graduate. And he was very lucky in that. He was he he he. I, I still have the design somewhere. He did a brooch, uh, a pin with you know in the shape of a fruit basket with with sending precious jewels on it, and he was very lucky in that the person who actually came forward and bought his item was Princess uh, Soraya Esfandari Bakhtiari, who was the ex-wife of the Shah of Iran. Wow, that's after, where that connection comes. Yes. So you know it was half you know she was half German half. Iranian and she was living in Germany at the time she just happened to see this piece and fell in love with it and she purchased it so you know he he had a good start um he came back to Ethiopia and uh of course you know he had grown up in the palace era you know in the palace he he you know his father worked there and the, the emperor had sent him abroad to study so he received his first commission from the emperor uh which was a monumental mission um he summoned him and told him he wanted him to build the new altar for holy trinity cathedral now this is a huge thing and uh you know um there was a lot of back and forth the emperor initially wanted the whole thing made of ivory and uh the my, my father told him that's not possible you know ivory doesn't have the strength to hold up um and you know, I I don't I wouldn't advise that. And so the emperor said, Well, what would you do? It's simple, we'd make it with fine woods, and you know, you could cover the pillars, the four pillars with ivory, um, beautiful carved ivory, and then you just cover the wood with silver and gold ornamentation, and just make it beautiful. So uh that's the plan they went with. And uh that it was through you know building the the, the altar for Hort, Holy Trinity that my father met Abat Damarem, um, who was then the Sultana of Holy Trinity and the future of Unamed Kassetik, and he became his confessor. They became very, very, very close friends. Uh, and uh, my father built that altar. And uh, when he saw the altar, the emperor was moved to tears and said, you know, God bless you. You're going to make another altar, this time <laughs> for Aksumsir. And uh, so my father was great. So he made another altar and he made it for, for Our Lady of Zion in Aksum. And, um, Which was refurbished the, by the emperor, right? Yes, yes. He built the new cathedral. He built the new cathedral. Uh, and this altar was for the new cathedral there. Um, the original, the oldest cathedral there that's still standing is the one built by Azifasi. Uh, but interestingly, my, you know, when, 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 the, when the altar, the new altar was finished, the emperor asked him specifically, of the two altars you built, which is the nicer one? Which one, which one is the better one? And, and my father said, well, you know, the one I just made for Aksum is, is a second uh, attempt. So, you know, the work is a little finer, it's, it's, it's better. And the emperor said, oh, okay. And uh, my father has always, always been partial to Holy Trinity Cathedral. There is nowhere on earth that my father loved more than Holy Trinity Cathedral. Nowhere. Um, and he's been everywhere, but nothing compared to Holy Trinity Cathedral to him. So he dared, you know, he was young. He was in his early 20s when he 
first started working for, for, for the emperor, but he, he suggested, he said, you know, why, you know, why don't we take the altar that's in Holy Trinity and take that to Aksum and we can put this better one here at Sedlesi. And he said the emperor was shocked. He was kind of recoiled. And he told him, no. He said, don't you know, Aksum is the holiest place in Ethiopia. The best has to go to Aksum. And um, my father went and assembled the, 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 the altar there. And he said that when he went there, that he realized you know, what Aksum meant and what Aksum was. Um, but you know, it makes you think that if that those altars had been built in this era, what the answer would have been. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, for a person, you know, who was thought of as, you know, identified as being belonging to this group that oppressed everybody else and everything was, you know, to his own group. The fact that he said, no, the best has to go to Aksu mm -hmm. says a lot. Um, a Shoan Oromo Amhara hybrid who expresses the Amhara culture exactly. who would have Tigray have better ornamentation. Yeah. But obviously, he didn't think in those ways. No, no. Um, we are, we're all the product of our times, right? Um, it makes me wonder, you know, if people in the future would have that type of foresight. Um, but um, going back, so my father did a lot of work for the palace. You know, aside from the two altars, he did, um, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a very famous, well, fairly famous gold handbag that the emperor gave to Jackie Kennedy. Um, it's a little egg shaped um, evening bag and it's, it's beautifully, you know, carved, you know, and, and, and filigree and it's got a line of Judah on it. it it's, it's, it's really remarkably beautiful. My father made that. He made other styles of little gold handbags. Uh, he made a sword uh, for Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh who passed away earlier this year. Mm -hmm. um, that's on exhibit right now at Windsor Castle. Um, he made swords for President T uh, Tito in Yugoslavia. He made a similar handbag for uh, Empress Farah of Iran, the Shah's final wife. Um, and and uh, you know he 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 did gifts that were given to heads of state around the world. Um, interestingly, there's a large processional cross. Uh, Ethiopian processional cross at the Abyssinia Baptist Church here in New York, uh, in Harlem. And that was given by Emperor Haile Selassie uh, to the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell, a junior, who was actually a congressman at the time, as well as the pastor of the uh, Abyssinia Baptist Church, as thanks for the Harlem community, uh, for all the fundraising and help that they had, you know, uh, taken up during the fascist occupation. It's a big silver processional cross. The, the, the Muzgor or the staff itself was made of silver. And that was made by my great uncles um, in, in the palace uh, when they were working in the palace. Uh, this was before my father was actually working. Um, but a similar cross was given to Notre Dame. It's still there. It survived the fire there. There's another one at... Um, at uh, Westminster Abbey, and there's one at the wow. National Cathedral in, in Washington, D.C. And these crosses were given um, to allied nations um, as thanks for uh, their help uh, in Ethiopia regaining its, its, uh, its uh, or being liberated from Italian occupation. Um, of course, you know, jewelry in Ethiopia goes, you know, the art of jewelry goes back many, many years and, and you know, the Aksum area is famous for its jewelers. Um, but, you know, uh, there's a long tradition of foreign jewelers coming in and, 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 and working with Ethiopians as well. Uh, the Armenian community produced mm -hmm. many, um, there was a large Armenian community in Ethiopia, and a lot of them were jewelers, and a lot of them were associated with the, with the palace. Uh, Pedro Savajan is one of those, uh, you know, he was the official crown jeweler uh, for many years. And he did a lot of work um, for the palace. He made a lot of the orders that you see the emperor wearing uh, were made by Savajian, you know. Um, but there's there's a long tradition of fine jewelry work in Ethiopia. And, you know, I'm, I'm sadly um, not uh, a jeweler. Um, 
you know, somebody once told my father, a government official again during the dark time, um, told my father that he agorotin uh, bed by not teaching his, his kids to be jewelers. My father wanted us to do our own thing, um, but I, I have my regrets. I wish I wish I had learned it uh, from him while he was around, um, because it is a very you know interesting and, and, and it's an art and it's uh, and in my family so it's a family art. Um, my, my uncles, my great uncles, my grandparents, my great grandparents were all involved in it. So I have my regrets in that in that area. But but you have the benefit of writing and speaking about it. Which is something, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, but you know, the, the 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 nice thing about it is there are tangible things uh, that that still exist that that speak to the artistry and the culture, and they're still there. Um, I'm very eager um, to see the Jubilee Palace open up. Um, I know that it's uh, under renovation now. They, there are plans, I believe, next year for it to open as a museum. They're going to move the president out of there. And uh, there are many items there that were made by my father and his brother and his you know, father and grandfather and so on that are in that collection. And it's going to be very exciting, I think, uh, for, for me to go back and see those things. Um, you know, it's all part of our history. Um, and it's not just, you know, jewelry, but there's you know, that the, the, the palace was home to all sorts of artisans. There were, you know, wood carvers. There were embroiders who did the mukash and all the gold embroidery and the silver embroidery on the robes. And, um, the, you know, the, the, even the kitchens. The, the, my, you know, my father, um, right after the revolution, was, was made to, um, wasn't uh, something that he wanted to do particularly, but he was made to inventory the, the contents of the palace. And uh, it was a long and arduous and difficult task. Um, they, they, they had to count everything in the palace and they had to assign a value to everything. And, you know, he said it was very difficult. They would bring him, you know, a woman's coat. You know, one of the princesses had an overcoat and he was told to assign a value. And he didn't know how much a coat cost. He would occasionally call my mother and say, yeah, how much would you buy for you know, an expensive coat? How much do you think the price of something would be? Um, but, you know, there were, there were, there, you know, there were all sorts of things that they inventoried. And one of the things that he remembered and was so fascinated by were these books that were from the time of Emperor Mindelik onward that had recipes, um, palace recipes for all sorts of dishes. And he said it was amazing, the variety of, of Ethiopian and non-Ethiopian foods that all had these, these wonderful recipes all written down and, 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 and put in books uh, for, for the kitchens. Um, there's so much um, in our history that I think we haven't even scratched. Sadly, I don't know if a lot of that has survived. I know that you know, a lot has, um, but you know, we really need to do better in preserving um, our, our heritage. Uh, I remember as a boy, there used to be this, this corporo or corrugated tin hut on the grounds of Holy Trinity Cathedral. It was all locked up. And, you know, we weren't allowed to go in it. It was locked up. But there was an open space um, at the top where you could look in. And in there were been these big marble slabs. And apparently there had been um, tombs that had been built for Emperor Haisalasi and Empress Menin that had eventually, you know, the emperor had decided that they were too ornate um, and had them dismantled. And I remember that there were slabs that had carved images of the emperor and empress in full coronation robes reclining on their backs as if they were asleep in full coronation robes. Kind of reminiscent to the tombs you see in Westminster Abbey of old British kings, you know, in their crowns and so on, lying on top of their tombs. They had built something similar. And I eventually emperor decided that these were too ornate and outside of Ethiopian tradition and had them demolished. But those are actually you know, really amazing works of art. And I'm sad to say, I, I think those have gone missing. I don't know that they're anywhere. Um, I don't know what's happened to them. Um, but we really need to do better in preserving, um, you know, 
I, I, I hear these stories about all oh, such and such historic building was, was demolished and so on. It really breaks my heart because we we are still eagerly pursuing the new and shiny. You know, we're building skyscrapers, you know, mm -hmm. at a crazy rate and and demolishing, you know, things that had, you know, beauty in their time but were just so neglected um, and weren't preserved. I think we need to do better um, as far as that. But uh, yeah, so I think you know, uh, back to, to, to my dad, he, he, he did a lot of work for the palace. He did a lot of work for the church. Um, and, you know, he, he, uh, he also worked with, uh, you know, and uh, and all the patriarchs. And, you know, I was very lucky, uh, in, in that I was ordained a, a deacon as a little boy by, by, uh, and I had served at the altar with and then I came to New York, you know, years later, and I served with uh, and going back to my ordination, the, the, the patriarchs was who is now so I have some exposure to all the patriarchs I've, I've I've lived under, I have a personal uh, exposure to them. Um, and it's, and I'm lucky. I think I'm, I'm very lucky in, in, in who I have been exposed to and what I've been exposed to in life. And I think it ha plays a role in my love and, of history and, you know, me being able to go on and on like this about topics. It's definitely uh, a blessing. And could you speak to the, the splendor of the, the new year, which is an uh, Ethiopian Orthodox, you know, it's tied to Ethiopia, but the old Ethiopia to which so many of the commentariat want to discredit. So I've gone out of my way on these large, especially on Instagram and other channels, whenever they want to poke fun at Ethiopia, you know, they poke fun at Ethiopia in the Orthodox Church. But for example, you know, nowadays it's commonplace for Protestants to want to wear the the kabba or the cape, which is, you know, a, 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 it's the churches yeah. uh, in, in their wedding ceremonies. And in the same fashion, uh, everyone, you know, Muslim, atheist, Protestant, whatever, will want to claim the calendar, which is also the the churches. And I, I, I just give them gentle reminders in the age of attribution and cultural appropriation. Remind them who that calendar, oh, that Bahara Hasab comes from, the Sea of Thought. Yes. So could you tell us about the the New Year's ceremony um, sure. that, that you wrote about? Yes. Um, so, you know, of course, uh, to, 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 I, I completely agree with, with, with what you said. There, there was a time when, when, when the, 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 the robes and the, and, and the rituals of the Orthodox Church were ridiculed by others. They were saying, oh, it's so backward. It's so you're so ritualistic and so traditional. But now we see them adopting the same practices. I've seen in, in, in other churches now. Um, because because it speaks to something and and they want to co-opt that um you know it's genuine um and it's 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 part of our experience as ethiopians and christians um but back to the inputatash or uh the new year um the the word inputatash comes from from inku which was which are jewels which were presented to the Queen of Sheba upon her return from Jerusalem, pregnant with King Solomon's child, which goes to the very foundation of the Ethiopian imperial dynasty. Um, when she came back, her nobles presented her with, with jewels and she came at the new year. So um, that's where that comes from. And so new year was a very important holiday um, in the palace almost as much as it was important in the church. Um, there were certain church, you know, religious holidays that were very integral to the imperial court. Um, and one of them, you know, there's, there's uh, as a maskel or, or uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, another holiday, which is extremely important in the palace. But the new year was one of those days where people were expected to go to the palace and, and, and pay homage to the ruler. Um, and when you went to the palace, it was a national dress day. 
and you're expected to show up in Ethiopian national dress. Uh, so people would wear their, you know, shamanet ala or, 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 or kuta, you know, uh, but there was a special way of wearing it. So it's called madagdeg. Now, today, uh, madagdeg, people are familiar with madagdeg uh, when you go to church. There are the two ways that people do it in church. Um, you'll see a lot of people will take it, throw over one shoulder, throw over the other shoulder. That's one form. Now that's yeah. a, that's usually the form that, that people wear it in church nowadays. When I was growing up, when you went into the church, this is how I was expected to wear it. So you would take it, you throw one shoulder, one over one shoulder. One over, that's how I have it on now. And they yeah. call that, I've heard that called maskalenya or the, the cross form. The yeah. other form that you showed over the shoulder uh, and then flick it over. Usually if you're a marigita, you got one little arm sticking off as if it uh, it doesn't work, but it's uh, mostly there for, for swag and style. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's who I exactly. usually see wearing. I, I always thought it was an age thing. I thought younger people put the cross and then when you're older, you get to do the other style. That, you know, as you get older, of course, you grow in degree in your church. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I have to say that when we when when we were at Qiddus and we were inside the Magdus, this was a must mm -hmm. uh, in the Magdus. Outside the Magdus, it was okay to to wear it the way that that you just you know the, over the show over both shoulders. Mm -hmm. Now, um, people, you know, nowadays, you know, they, they'll it's, it's just easier to wear it over both shoulders. I mean, and that's what we usually see in church. When you went to the palace, though, there was a specific way um, where you tied it around your waist, and then one shoulder, then one end of the net ala comes over your shoulder. Mm. So it's just one here, and then the rest of it is around your waist. In the old days, uh, before you know we, you know, weaklings of the pre present generation were around, you know, back in the time of Atsi Tudros. There was no shirt, so you were bare chested. And you had this <laughs> for one shoulder. So interestingly, um, Tudros was one of these iconoclasts that you know wanted things to be simple and easy. He, you know, at the time that he was on the throne, there was another living emperor around. There was Azihans the third, uh, who had abdicated, and you know he he was basically you know overthrown by Tudros. But he acquiesced to the to the dethronement, and his condition was, you know, just make sure I never have to see my wife again, and I'm all for this. Uh, he was married to Tigimanen uh, Dibanamadi, was a very very strong character. So Johannes the Third didn't care for his wife. So Theodros granted that wish. Um, but whenever Theodros, whenever Johannes the Third came into Theodros's presence. Everyone was expected to come in to 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 the emperor's presence. Um, but when Johannes the Third walked into the presence of Theodos II, Theodos would rise from his throne, take his shema off, and madegdeg. Because Johannes the Third had received that same imperial anointing and crowning that he had received. So he was in the they were both in the presence of an emperor. So they would both madegdeg. Um that says a lot about Theodros II, you know, he, mm -hmm. he could be very harsh against people, you know, that he needed to be harsh to, but he was one of those people who could also, you know, really um, honor his traditions as well. Um, and, and and that was one. So, you know, this madegdegging, which uh, for the palace form of madegdegging has, you know, fallen out of practice, people just uh, don't do it anymore because you know, certainly not bare chested um, and no, maybe no. maybe in some touch bit or bunna bit. maybe but in the palace it doesn't happen anymore nobody's going in front of president Salawak or prime minister Abi, you know my <laughs> uh, but um a, a, a friend of mine who, who lives in europe went to see the renovated palace um you, you, you may be able to see it on my on my timeline on facebook but he 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 wrote me and said, hey, can you explain to me how I should madagdeg? And I'm like, oh, really? But, you know, what, what's going on? And he said, I'm going to the palace. I'm going to go see 
the, the ad darash and when I appear in front of you know this this wax work of of, of confirming like I'd like to be in the proper form. And he sent me a picture, which I couldn't resist, I had to post, um, of him in the traditional form of Madag Deging in front of, of Minlik's uh, image in, in the Ad Daraj, which I thought was a really great way of, of honoring his, 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 his legacy and his history. I was very proud of him for doing that. Um, but these are little things that can easily get lost. Um, you know, just the, the simple way of, of wearing your clothes, uh, just the simple, simple little traditions that once you stop, um, you know, because there is no more, you know, there isn't an emperor in the palace that you need to mind. Like, for this could easily be lost, and it's really important to to to, to record them and to keep them uh, from vanishing from from our, you know, from our history. Absolutely, and I appreciate you and your friend for for doing it, and Prime Minister Abi for those you know those recent additions which in in more recent times they were less friendly to things like that whatever people want to make about his pol uh, political and military decisions i think it's been very fascinating and of course he has a very mixed background of his own but that uh an allegedly <laughs> protestant man would go out of his way to so many times, you know, kiss the cross of our bishops, including uh, receive the capes and the gospel from the church and uh, speak so highly of the artwork and the creativity, which is, you know, it's really just him shooting the straight facts when no one else yeah. was, was doing so. And uh, we've talked a lot about history as we slowly come to a close, I, I would love if you could talk about this award you received and this organization, which is more uh, uh, contemporary or as much as you would be uh, comfortable with, but the, the, the Crown Council of uh, Ethiopia, obviously in, in, in exile and uh, close by plugging hard and giving a preview of what is to come with Yatarik Amba, which is a podcast that I am very much looking forward to, as I always look forward to your writings. Thank you, thank you very much, Brother Deacon. Um, so just to, to, to the first point, um, uh, three years ago, I was very, very honored uh, by the Ethiopian Crown Council uh, uh, to be uh, awarded the um, Star of Honor of Ethiopia and the Commander class. Um, the Star of Honor of Ethiopia is one of the old imperial orders that were awarded by the emperors of Ethiopia. Um, there are several awards. Uh, Star of Ethiopia is one of them. And I was awarded that uh, for my services in, in preserving and perpetuating Ethiopian history, uh, for my work in, in, in writing about it and so on. And I was uh, very honored to receive that from Prince Hermias and the Crown Council uh, at their annual um, Adwa dinner, Victory of Adwa dinner in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's an event that's held every year. Last year it wasn't held because of COVID, but every year they do award um, these these old um, imperial orders to deserving people. Um, the year before last, uh, they awarded many um, people uh, with that grade and higher grades of the award for worthy causes, you know, educators, um, people who've done a great deal of uh, philanthropic work in Ethiopia and so on. Um, but uh, to, to plug my own project, um, I am in the process of launching a podcast slash video cast called Tariq Amba. Um, it is a project in which I will try to, um, to introduce and uh, to talk about uh, Ethiopian history uh, and Ethiopian culture. Uh, to geared towards, you know, anyone who's interested, of course, but mainly geared to Ethiopians in the diaspora. Um, I think there is a huge need in uh, among our diaspora youth, especially um, to find out about Ethiopian culture and to find out about Ethiopian history. And Tari Kamba will uh, go through um, Ethiopian history, the different eras, the different leaders, um, and as much as I can, I I, I, I try, uh, in, as you've seen in my in my in my writing in Ethiopian, uh, on, on Facebook and elsewhere, um, 
I try to be um, as even keeled and as uh, even minded um, about figures in Ethiopian history. And I will try to carry that out on Tariq Amba. Um, there is a website, tarikamba.com, which is uh, pretty empty right now. Tariq is spelled uh, T A R I K Amba, A M B A.com. Um, Tariq means history. Um, in, in Amharic and Amba, Ambas are the flat topped mountains, which are uh, the homes for our fortresses and our monasteries. They are, they've been prisons and they've been sanctuaries and uh, a mountain of history uh, is what we have in Ethiopia. And that is why I named it uh, Tariq Amba. Our history is our, is our fortress and it's our refuge. And it's important to know that so um, that's why I named it that, and hopefully uh, it will launch at the end of this month, the beginning of next month. Uh, so please look out for it. Thank you so much for your service in the preservation, and not just preservation, but extension of our history. You've you've lived it, and you are writing about it, and now we'll be hearing your voice and seeing your face alongside it. And I am excited for all of these things. And we have to get you on again when you have more episodes under your belt so we can point Absolutely. people with uh, more more links and access and so that they could learn a lot more. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. It's been a huge pleasure and honor for me as well. I'm a fan. Um, I, I do follow you. Uh, and uh, I wish you all the best in your projects as well. Thank you very much.